Chapter 29 of The Later Life by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Constance remained alone the whole evening. She had opened both her bedroom windows wide, and she looked out over the road into the sultry night. She had undressed and put on a white wrapper, and she remained sitting in the dark room at the open window. For a moment she thought that van der Velke would come to her to tell her his decision, but he did not come. He seemed to be staying with Addie in the dining room. Then she heard him go to his own room. In the silence, in the still, sultry darkness, which seemed to enter the room almost heavily, her restlessness, the doubt which she had felt rising in herself during those few words with Addie, melted away. Sitting at the open window, she let herself be borne along by the silent, insidious magic of the late summer hour, as though something stronger than herself were overpowering her and compelling her to surrender herself, without further thinking or doubting, to a host of almost disquieting raptures which came crowding in upon her. Above the darkling masses of the woods hung the sullen menace of heavy rain, and, just once or twice, there was a gleam of lightning yonder, in the direction of the sea, which she divined in the distance, flashing with sudden illuminations, with noiseless reflections, and then vanishing in the low-hanging clouds of the night. She lay back in her chair, at first oppressed by her doubt and by the heat, but gradually, gradually, her eyes fixed on the electric gleams far in the distance, all her doubts melted away. The enchantment penetrated yet deeper, and the storm-charged sultriness seemed a languorous ecstasy in which her breast heaved gently, her lips opened, and her eyes closed, only to open again wider than before, and stare at the lightning that flashed and vanished, flashed and vanished, with intervals full of mystery. No, she doubted no longer, all would be well, all would be well. She could not make a mistake in this new life, this later life, this mature life, which she had lived, so to speak, in a few months, giving herself up entirely to sincerity and honesty, and to the crowning love, the only really true and lofty love. Her love, that late love, had been her life, right from those girlish dreams of a few months past, down to the moments of inward avowal. And what in another woman would have lasted years, in the slow falling of the days, which, like beads on a long string, fell one by one through the fingers of silent fate, the unrelenting teller of the beads, she had lived in a few months. After her dreaming had come her thinking, after her thinking, her wish to know, after her wish to know, her plunge into books and nature, until dreaming, thinking, knowledge, and above all, love supreme and triumphant, had mingled to form a new existence, and she had been reborn, as it were, out of herself. She had dreamed and thought and questioned it all hastily and feverishly, as though afraid of being late, of feeling her senses numbed, her soul withered by the grey years, before she had lived, before she had lived. Hastily, but in all sincerity, and her late awakening had been deep and intense, a mystery to herself, and an impenetrable secret to all, for no one knew that she dreamed and thought, and questioned knowledge and nature. No one knew that nowadays she looked on a tree, a cloud, a book, a picture, with different eyes than in the past, when she had neither eyes nor understanding for tree or cloud, for book or picture, nor found beauty in any. No one saw that something cosmic and eternal flashed before her in that one swift glance of tardy recognition and knowledge. No one knew that she, the aristocrat, felt that keen pity for her day and generation, had learnt to feel it from him, through him. All of it, all of it, all her later life, no one knew it, save herself alone. And gradually, too, in those intimate conversations, they had come to know something of each other, had learnt, guessing first and then knowing, that they had found each other, 
late in life she him he her as though at last at last after that vague instinctive seeking and trying to find each other in their childhood days heaven had been merciful how vague it had been that shadowy intuition hardly to be uttered and vanishing as soon as uttered on his side that distant veil of mist that cloud on the horizon of the moors on hers that perpetual longing to go farther to flit from boulder to boulder down the hurrying stream as it rushed past under the dense canopy of those tropical trees a pair of children knowing nothing of each other and all unconscious until years later that they were both seeking both seeking oh that strange dream quest that nameless desire which when one breathed it vanished was no longer a quest at a touch it became intangible as soon as one grasped it it slipped away became something different something different but unbreathed untouched ungrasped just dreamed and dimly felt in those far-off childhood days it was that the mystic wonderful reality which was the only reality to both of them in those days it had been too gossamer frail too intangible and too incomprehensible to last beyond their childhood that seed of reality working in the womb of time vanity and frivolity had claimed her for their own study and reflection had claimed him and each had wandered farther and farther from that half divined other no longer even seeking the other the years had heaped themselves up between them between her at the hague in rome in brussels and him in america when she was an elegant young society woman he the workman's friend and brother their comrade who yearned to know and understand them while she had danced and flirted in the ballrooms of rome he had laboured in the docks gone down the black shafts of the coal mines and all this which had really happened seemed unreal to her a dream a remote nightmare by the side of that childish romance those fairy visions of yesterday and yet it had all happened it had all happened they had never been allowed to meet each other not even when they had been brought near each other on the riviera in brussels as by an unconscious power they had not been allowed to meet until now late very late too late oh is it ever given too late that blessed boon to live at last to find at last and they had both made mistakes she had made her mistakes her brief passion for henry the sudden kindling of the senses of a frivolous bored and idle woman then the marriage mistake upon mistake nothing but waste 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 of her precious life and he had made mistakes too he had dreamed of being the brother of those men a fellow worker and comrade and he had not become their brother oh if they had once been allowed to know and find each other in the years when they were both young what a harmony their life together might have been no jarring note in themselves or in each other but perfect harmony in all things attuned to the note of their day and generation he by her side to understand and love her and support her when the sadness of it all oppressed her oh to have lived when still young with him in his heart in his arms and then to have loved to have understood to have done with him and for his sake all that can still be done for one's day and generation by those who themselves are strong and radiant in love and happiness and harmony and it had not been so the precious years far from each other had been wasted by him he had told her so by her oh her vain wasted years no fate had not willed it and yet now that at last at last the honest simple true life had kindled into flame now that after first thinking of others of henry of marianne she had also thought of herself also thought of him could not an outward physical life also be kindled 
after that inward spiritual life, far from everything and everybody around them, in another country and another world, a life in which she would be beside him, a life of harmony, which might be tinged with the melancholy of that late awakening, but would still be perfect harmony and perfect happiness. She lay back in her chair, her hands hanging limply beside her, as if she lacked the energy now to grasp the tempting illusion, afraid of losing it and afraid of seizing it, and then recognising it as an illusion. And the sultry air seemed to be pressing upon her softly and languorously, until she panted and her lips parted and her eyes closed only to open again, wider than before. And in that atmosphere of ecstasy, it appeared to her that the distant lightning streaks yonder, the noiseless flashes over the wide sea which she divined yonder, yonder, far away, were themselves the swift effulgence of her thoughts and illusions and regrets, a gleam and gone, a gleam and gone. When it gleamed, came the smiling hope that things could become and remain as she thought. When the lights faded, came doubt, yet not so deep, but that the night tempted and lured her. Hope again, think once more, dream again, it may be, it is not impossible, it is reality, pure, simple reality, it will mean the happiness of those two poor children, Henry and Marianne, it will be the happiness of you two, him and you, the woman whose life blossomed late. It is possible. Hope it again. Think. Dream it again. For what is impossibility when truth once stands revealed, however late? See, the truth stands revealed. The lightning flashes. Sometimes the whole sky is illumined at once. The low clouds drift along. Behind them, behind them lies the infinity of eternity, of everything that may happen. The room was quite dark. She herself alone remained a white blur in the window frame, and the night, the air, the lights were there outside, wide and eternal. And in the sweet languor of the late summer hour, of the sultry night, of her uncontrollable illusion and hopes, she felt as though she were uplifted by a flood of radiant ecstasy, by a winged joy that carried her with it towards the sea yonder towards the bright rifts of the lightning flashes, towards the distance of futurity, eternity, and everything that might happen. And she let herself be borne along, and in that moment a certainty came over her, penetrated deep down in her, like a divinely implanted conviction, that it would be as she had dreamed and hoped and wished, that so it would happen at long last, because life's chiefest grace was at length descending upon her. Yes, it would happen like that. She knew it. She saw it in the future. She saw herself living by his side, in his heart, in his arms, living for herself and him, living for each other in all things. She saw it shine out radiantly with each lightning flash, in the radiant shining of those future years. She saw them, those children of the past, with the dew upon them, smiling to each other as though they who, as boy and girl, had unconsciously sought each other, had grown into a young man and a maiden who had found each other after the mystery of the cloud veil and of the distant river under the spreading leaves. And they now went on together, their paths ran up towards the glittering cities of the future, which reared their crystal domes under the revealing skies, while out from their riot of towers sunbeams flashed and struck a thousand colours from the crystal domes. A wind rose as though waking in the very bed of the slumbering night and leapt to the sky. A cool breath drifted straight out of the sultry, lowering clouds. A few drops pattered upon the leaves, and the wind carried the storm farther, carried the revelation with it. The lightning flashed, twice, thrice more, vanished, paled away. 
not until it had travelled far, very far, would the wind let loose the clouds, would the night rain fall, so Constance thought, vaguely, and she sighed deeply, as though waking out of her languor of ecstasy, now that the night, after that rising wind, was no longer so sultry and oppressive. She stood up, wearily, closed the window, saw a morning pallor already dawning through the trees, and she lay down and fell asleep. Yes, that was what would happen. It would be like that. She felt certain of it. That future would come. The paths ran to the crystal-domed city. She was going to it, with him, with him. Yes, it would come, it would come. Tomorrow, yes, tomorrow. And while that hope still continued to transfigure her face, pale on the pillow in the dawning day, her eyes, blind from long gazing at the light, closed heavily, and she fell asleep, convinced, convinced. End of chapter 29「30 of the Later Life」by Louis Couperos. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Conviction had conquered doubt and reigned triumphant. When Constance awoke early that morning, she was full of proud, calm confidence, as though she knew the future positively. She hesitated to go to her husband in his room, and he seemed to avoid her too for as early as seven o'clock she saw him, from her window, riding off on his bicycle. Since their conversation she had not seen him, did not know what he thought, and it struck her that he was not dashing away as he had done so often lately, like a madman, but that he pedalled along quietly, with a certain melancholy resignation in his face, which he just saw flickering past under his bicycling cap. She listened to hear if Addy was awake, but he seemed to be still asleep. Also, it was holiday time, and she began to think of Van Freysweik, and made up her mind to write to him, just a line to ask him to come, a single line which, however, would at once allow him to read between the letters that Marianne could not love him. And while thinking, with a tender pity for him, amid her own calm certainty, she bit her pen, looked out of the window. The August morning was already sunny at that hour. There was a blue sky with white, fleecy clouds, which passed like flocks of snowy sheep through a blue meadow. The wind urged the sheep before it like an impetuous drover, and while she searched for those difficult words, her mind recalled the night before, and the lightning yonder above the sea, which she defined in the distance. It was strange, but now, in that morning light, with that placid sky at which she gazed, thinking of Van Freysweik, and how to tell him in a single merciful word, with that summer blue full of fleecy white, at which she was gazing so fixedly after the ecstasy and winged bliss that had uplifted her the night before. It was as if her calm, proud confidence in her knowledge of the future was wavering, she did not know why, for after all she thought that Henry would consent to their divorcing. They would be divorced, and Marianne would. Suddenly she began to write. She wrote more than she intended to write. She now wrote the truth straight away in an impulse of honesty, and at the end of her letter she asked Van Freysweik to call on her that evening. She had just finished when Addy came in, he kissed her and waited until she had signed her letter. "'Why aren't you bicycling with Papa?' she asked. He said that his father had asked him to speak to her, and now, sitting beside her with her hand in his, he told her, without once mentioning Marianne's name, what Papa had said. His calm, almost cold, business-like words sobered her completely while she continued pensively to look at the sky which seemed now to be wearing a blue smile of ignorance and indifference. Suddenly it seemed to her as if she had been dreaming. Not that her thoughts took any definite form, for first 
the ideal vision whose realisation had seemed so certain, then the morning doubts, and now the disenchantment of the sober facts, had all followed too swiftly upon one another, and she could not take it all in. She did not know what she thought. It only seemed to her as if she had been dreaming. Automatically, she said, Perhaps it is better so. She had not expected it. She had never thought that Henry's answer would be the one that she now heard from the mouth of their son. Did one ever know another person, though one lived with that person for years? Did she know her son? Did she know herself? But the boy held her hand affectionately, and he read the stupefaction in her eyes. Tell me, honestly, Mamma, are you disappointed? She was silent, gazed at the placid sky. Would you rather have started a fresh life, away from Papa? She bowed her head, let it rest upon his shoulder. Addy, she said. She made an attempt to pick her words, but her honesty was once more too strong for her. Yes, she said simply. Then you would rather have had it so, for your own sake? I would rather have had it so, yes. They were silent. I had even pictured it, like that, she said presently. Shall I speak to Papa again then, Mamma, if I tell him that you had already been thinking of it? You believe? He will agree. Do you think so? If it means the happiness of both of you. Tell me what Papa said. I can't remember exactly. Only Papa thought that not to see me for six months at a time would be more than he could bear. Is that all that Papa said? Yes. But he gave just a smile of melancholy resignation, and his look told that that was not all. She understood that they had spoken of Marianne. So, Papa, she repeated, would rather stay with us, Mamma. With us, she repeated. We three together? Yes. It means going on living. A lie, she said in a blank voice. Then I will speak to Papa again. No, Addy. Why not? No, don't do that. Don't ask Papa to think it's all over again. It is perhaps too late, after all. And besides, Papa is right about you. About me? He could not go six months without you. And I? And you, Mamma? I couldn't either. Yes, you could. No, I couldn't either. She suddenly passed her hands along his face, along his shoulders, his knees, as though she wished to feel him, to feel the reality, the reality of her life. He, he was the real thing, the truth, but all the rest between her husband and her was falsehood, remained falsehood, because of people. Could they not, even for Addie's sake, purge that falsehood into truth? No, no, not even for him. Would falsehood then always cleave to them? We are too small, she thought, and murmured her thought aloud. What did you say? Nothing. Very well, Addy. Tell Papa that it shall be as he says, that I am quite content, that I could not do without you either, for six months. She looked at him, looked into his serious blue eyes, as though she had forgotten him, and were now remembering him for the first time. Six months! Six months without him! The new life! The new paths! The new cities! On those far-off new horizons! And six months! Six months without Addy! Had she then been dreaming? Had she just been dazzled by that glittering vision? Was it just intoxication, ecstasy? Was it just glamour and enchantment? He left her. She dressed and went downstairs. She felt as if she were back from a long journey and seeing her house again after an absence of months. Her movements were almost like those of a sleepwalker. The house seemed something remote and impersonal, though she had always loved it looked after it, made it her beautiful home by a thousand intimate touches. She now went through the house, 
mechanically performing her usual little housewifely duties, still half dreaming, in a condition of semi consciousness. It was as if her thoughts were standing still, as if she no longer knew, nor for that matter thought, remembering only the night before, that lonely evening of inward conviction. The morning had dawned, placid with its cloudless sky. Addy had come. She now knew what Henry thought. It surprised her just a little that Henry thought like that. And then she realised that after all he did not love Marianne very much, that he must love her less than Addy. Poor Marianne, she thought, and she reflected that women love more absolutely than men. She spoke to the servant, gave her orders, did all the actual everyday things in between her thoughts. And suddenly she looked deep down into herself, once more saw so completely into her own clear depths that she was startled at herself and shuddered. She saw that, if Henry had made the same proposal to her that she had made to him, she would have accepted it in her desire for happiness, for happiness with the man whom she loved, and who, she felt it, loved her. She saw that she would have accepted, and that she would not have hesitated because of her son. Her son! He was certain to be leaving them soon in any case, to seek his own life. Her son! To provide him for a few years more with the paternal house, that wretched fabric of lies, which he, the boy, alone kept together, for his sake, and for the sake of that joint falsehood, she would have to reject the new life of truth. It was as if she were standing in a maze, but she was certain that she would not have hesitated in that maze if the decision had been left to her, that she would have known how to take the path of simple honesty, and she would have elected to separate, in spite of Addy, that she loved her new life and the stranger, more than her child. She had learnt to know herself in that new atmosphere of pure truth, and now, now she saw so far into those translucent depths that she was frightened and shuddered as in the presence of something monstrous, for it seemed monstrous to her to place anything above her child, above the dear solace of so many years. Just then, van der Velke came home, she heard him put away his bicycle, go up the stairs, and then turn back, as if reflecting that he could no longer avoid his wife. He entered abruptly. She, trembling, had sat down, because she felt on the verge of falling. "'Has Addy told you?' he asked. "'Yes,' she said, in a low voice. "'And you think it is the best thing?' "'Yes, I do. "'So everything remains,' he said hesitatingly. As it was, she replied, almost inaudibly, and her voice hesitated also. He told you the reason, he went on. Yes, I could not do without him, all the time that he would be with you, Constance. And you couldn't do without the boy either, could you, while he was with me? No, she said automatically, and, as her voice failed her, she repeated more firmly, no, I should not be able to do without him. At that moment, she did not know if she was speaking the truth or not. Only she had a vague sensation, as though that fair, unsullied truth were retreating a little farther from her, like a glittering cloud. Then we might try to be more patient with each other, he said. But still, I should like to tell you, Constance, that I appreciate your thought, your intention. Yes she said vaguely. Your thought for me? Yes. But she now found it impossible to let that retreating truth slip still farther from her, and she said, I was thinking of myself also, Henry, but it was not clear to me what I thought. I don't quite know. Henry, it is better like this, for everything to remain as it was. And we both of us love our boy. Yes, both of us. He saw her turn very pale as she leant back in her chair, her arms hanging limply beside her. He had a sudden impulse to say something kind, to give her a kiss, 
but at the same time he was conscious that neither his words nor his caress would reach her, and he thought, what was the good of it? They had no love for each other, they would remain strangers in spite of all that they had felt for each other during these days. She suggesting for his happiness something dead against convention, he thrilling with genuine gratitude. Well, that is settled then, was all that he said in conclusion, quietly, and he went out, gently closing the door behind him. She did not move, but sat there, gazing dully into space. Yes, she had counted her son a lesser thing than her new life. That was the simple truth, just as much as the new life itself. And now, now, as though her mind were wandering, she saw that new life like a crystal city around her, threatening to crack, to rend asunder, to be shattered in one mighty spasm of despair. Her eyes began to burn from staring into those distant, cruel thoughts. In her breast she felt a physical pain. The house, the room, stifled her. She felt impelled to fly from that house, from the narrow circles which whirled giddily around her, to fly from herself. She was so much perplexed in her own being, no longer knowing what was right, what was honest, what true, that she yearned for space and air. Her breast was wrung with grief and that gasping for breath. Still, she controlled herself, took up a hat, pinned it on, and found the strength to say to the servant, Troucher, I am going out. She was outside now, in the road. She had become afraid of the loneliness of her room and of herself, a loneliness which in other ways had become so dear to her. Now she was seeking something more than spaciousness of air and forest, but the road in which a few people were walking made her keep herself under control. She turned down a side path, went through the woods. There were people taking their morning stroll. Suddenly she gave a violent start. She saw Browse sitting on a bench. She felt as if she would faint, and, without knowing what she was doing, she turned round and walked back. By this time she had lost all her self-command. He had seen her, however, and his hand had already gone up to his hat. Suddenly she heard his step behind her. He came up with her. "'Is this how you run away from your friends?' he said, making an attempt to joke, but in obvious astonishment. She looked at him, and he was struck with her confusion. "'Don't be angry,' she said frankly, "'but I was startled at seeing you.' "'I was not welcome,' he said roughly. "'Forgive me, my frau. I ought not to have come after you. But I'm a tactless beggar in these matters. I'm not one of your society men.' "'Don't be angry,' she repeated almost entreatingly. Society, indeed. I certainly showed myself no society woman. Too unexpectedly to... She did not know what she wanted to say. To turn your back on me, he said, completing the sentence. To turn my back on you, she repeated. Well, now that I have said good morning... He lifted his hat, moved as though to go back. Stay, she entreated. Walk a little way with me. Now that I happen to have met you. I came back yesterday. I meant to call on you today or tomorrow. Walk with me, she said, almost entreatingly. I want to speak to you. What about? I suggested to Henry. She drew a deep breath. There were people passing. They were near the ponds. She ceased speaking and they walked on silently. I suggested to Henry, she repeated at last. That we should. The word died away on her lips, but he understood. They were both silent, both walked on without speaking. He led the way, and it seemed to her that they were making for a goal, she knew not where, which he would know. At last she said, I wanted, as you are our friend, to tell you. He was determined to make her say the word. You suggested what? That we should be divorced. They walked on for some minutes. 
Suddenly, round about her, she saw the dunes, the distant sea, the sea which she had divined the night before, over which the pale gleams, the lightning flashes, had revealed themselves. Now the sky overhead was revealed, a vague opal, with white clouds curling like steam. I suggested that we should be divorced, she repeated. He drew a breath in the salt breath of the sea, even as he had breathed in the Alps when contemplating those ice-bound horizons. And he remembered that vision and the yearning for the one soul, the meeting which would have been a consolation amid the constant disappointment encountered with the many souls, the thousands, and a swift, keen hope seemed to flash before him, not only of having found its last, in silence, but of venturing to utter it, once, and so keen, so dazzling was the hope, that at first he did not hear her say, But Henry thinks it is better not. What? he asked, as though deaf, as though blind. She repeated, Henry thinks it is better not, because of our boy, of Addy. The keen hope had flashed for only a second, swiftly with its dizzying rays. Uttered it would never be, to have found in silence. Alas, that was all illusion, a dream, when one is very young. He is right, he said in a low voice. Is he right? she asked sadly and more firmly she repeated, Yes, he is right. I should have been sorry, for Addy's sake, he said. Yes, she repeated, as though in a trance. I should have been sorry for Addy's sake, but I had thought that I should be able to live at last, my God, at last, in absolute truth and sincerity, and not in a narrow ring of convention, not in terror of people, and what they may think absurd, and cannot understand, and, and... And? he asked. And, in that thought, in that hope, I had forgotten my boy, and yet he is the reality. And yet he is the reality. And now I am sacrificing the dream, the illusion, to him. Yes, the dream, the illusion, he said with a smile that was full of pain. It hurts me, she confessed with a sob. Yesterday, oh, only yesterday, last night, I thought that the dream, the illusion, was truth. But what for young people can be a dream, an illusion, which comes true? Is it our age? Absurd, she asked, still wavering. Not absurd, perhaps, but impossible. We go bent under too heavy a burden of the past to permit ourselves youthful dreams and illusions. We no longer have any right, even to memories. I have some, from my childhood, she stammered vaguely. There are no memories left for us, he said gently, with his smile that was full of pain. No, there are none left for us, she repeated, and she confessed. I have dreamed and thought too late. I... I have begun to live too late. I, he said, I thought that I had lived, but I have done nothing but seek. You never found? Perhaps, almost, but when I had found, I was not allowed to put out my hand. Because of the past? She asked softly. And of the present, because of what is and has younger, fresher rights than mine, which are no rights, but the forbidden illusions of an old man. Not old. Older every day. He alone is in the prime of life who has found, or thinks that he has found. Yes, that is so, she said, and her voice sounded like a wail. I have begun to live too late. I could have lived, even now, perhaps, but it is all too late. I once told you that I was abdicating my youth. Once, months ago. Since then, I have thought, dreamt, lived too much, not to feel young, for a few moments. But it was all an illusion, and it is all too late. They looked at each other. He bowed his head in gentle acquiescence, with his smile that was full of pain. 
Yes, it is so, he said, and it was almost as if he were joking. Come, let us be strong. I shall go on seeking. And you? Oh, I have my boy, she murmured. He has always comforted me. They walked back slowly and took leave of each other at the door, a friend's leave-taking. "'Will you come again soon?' she asked. "'I don't know,' he said. "'You know, you no sooner see me than I am gone. I may go to England in the autumn to lecture on peace. The world is full of mighty problems, and we, we are pygmies, in the tiny worlds of our own selves. Yes, we are nothing.' He left her. She was conscious of a sort of farewell in the pressure of his hand. She went in with her head swimming, and her son was there, and she embraced him as though asking his forgiveness. Addy, she said softly, Papa was right. Papa was right. I believe that I now know for certain, dear, that I know for certain that Papa was right. Oh, Addy, whatever I may lose... You will not let me lose you. End of chapter 30「Chapter 31 of the Later Life by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Had it all been an illusion then? Was it all for nothing? The days passed slowly, one after the other. She saw Van Freysveik and felt for him, their friend, in his silent grief. She bade good-bye to Bertha and her children. She knew that Van der Velke had seen Marianne once more before her departure, and her heart was full of pity for them both. Had it all been an illusion, then, this world of feeling, this little world of her own self? Oh, he was going to England to lecture on peace. For him... There were always those mighty problems which consoled him for the smallness of that little world of self. But she, had she lost everything, now that the illusion no longer shone before her, now that the magic cities had fallen to pieces, now that everything had become very dreary in the disenchantment and self-reproach of realising that she had not loved her son enough, that she had not loved him as well as his father loved him, not as well as she had loved the stranger, the friend who had taught her to live. Had she lost everything then? Now, ah, now, she was really old, grey-haired. Now her eye was no longer bright, her step no longer brisk. Now it was really all over, and it was over for ever. But had she lost everything then? This was what she often asked herself in the days that followed, those days of sadness. Sadness for herself, for him, for her son, for her husband, for the girl whom she loved too, for all those people, for all her life. And what of the great questions, the mighty problems of life? Ah, they no longer stood out before her, now that he who had called her attention to them had gone straight towards those mighty problems as to the towers of the greater life. To her, they seemed infinitely remote, shadowy cities on a far horizon behind her own shattered cities of translucent hopes. Had she then lost her interest in all those things, and having lost that interest, did she no longer care for her own development, for books, nature, art? Was the life that she had been living all illusion, a dream life of love, lived under his influence? lived under his compelling eyes. Yes, that was how it had been, that was how she would have to acknowledge it to herself, that was how it was, that was how it was. Only with his eyes upon her had she felt herself born again, born again from her childhood onwards, until she had once more conjured up the fairy vision of the little girl with the red flowers on her temples, who ran over the boulders in the river, under the spreading tropical leaves, beckoning the wondering little brothers. And she, a middle-aged woman, had grown into a girl who dreamed the shimmering dreams that were wafted along rainbow paths towards the distant clouds high in the heavens. 
In her maturity, she had developed herself hurriedly, as though afraid of being too late, into a thinking, feeling, loving woman. She had been sincere in that new, hurried life. But it had been nothing more than illusion, and illusion alone, the illusion of a woman who felt herself growing old, without ever, ever having lived. But though it had all been illusion, was illusion nothing then, or was illusion indeed something, something of no great account? And even though she had lived only illusion, illusion, under the compelling eyes of the man whom she loved, feeling love for the first and only time, under the brooding, anguished eyes of that thinker and seeker, had she not lived then, had she not lived then? Yes, she had, she had lived, in the way in which a woman like herself, a woman who had never felt, simply and sincerely, except as a child, in those far-off childish days, a woman whose life had been nothing but artificiality and failure, could live again, only later still, older still, old almost and finished. She had lived in illusions, in a fleeting illusion, which just for one moment she had tried to grasp that day, now a few months ago. She shook her head, her grey head. She was no longer blinded. She saw, she saw that it could never have been. Yet she felt that they had, both of them, lived the illusion, both of them, for a little while, and was nothing left of it. Now that the long, dreary days of sadness were drawing on, she saw, she saw that there was indeed something left, that a ray of light remained in her small soul, which had only been able to live like that, very late. For she saw that, in spite of all her repining, there was still gratitude. Yes, she was grateful, for she had lived, even though everything had been illusion the late blossoming of ephemeral dream-flowers. And now, when she felt that strange question rise in her soul, is this life, this futile endless round, or is there, is there anything else? When she felt that bewildering, passionate doubt, then she was conscious, deep down in her heart, with a throb of gratitude, that there was something else. Illusion. Yes, only illusion, without which there is no life. End of chapter 31 End of The Later Life by Louis Couperus Read by Phil Benson in Sydney, Australia The story of the small souls continues in the third book of the quartet, The Twilight of the Souls.